good. I don't project my voice the same way Mark does, so I just want to check that people can hear me. Um, but yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Alex. I'm one of the leaders here at Hope Church. And it is my joy this morning to be carrying on our series in the book of Philippians, looking um, at this idea of choose. The book of Philippians, if you don't know, is a book written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison, uh, writing to a church. And in that, he kind of outlines a lot of, a lot of ideas, a lot of concepts, a lot of almost like mini essays on various things around what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And we've been unpacking that over the last few weeks with this idea of choose. Paul gives um, the Philippian church a kind of a concept of choosing different things to take your steps in your Christian walk. And so we've looked at, as Adam has said, choosing thankfulness. Uh, Tom unpacked that for us with choosing thankfulness, particularly with, with gospel partners. Um, and then we had Choose Joy, where, where Adama uh, spoke to us about that a couple of weeks ago. And then Charles spoke to us last week about choosing humility. But this week, I'm going to focus on something that may seem pretty obvious, which is to choose Jesus, or to expand that, to choose Jesus above all things. And you might think, well, I'm at church this morning. Of course I'm choosing Jesus. That's why I'm here. I'm, we've been singing about Jesus. If you walk into the building, wherever you're at in your, in your faith walk, whether you're a long-time believer or you're just exploring it, I'm sure you still feel like, well, I've, I've made some conscious effort to choose Jesus today because I'm here. But what I want to do is unpack what Paul says to the Philippian church in chapter 3, and we're going to do a bit of a deep dive. We're going to try and go through verse by verse, the first 11 or 12 verses of Philippians 3, and just see how Paul talks about this idea of choosing Jesus. So to give a bit of background, again, on the Philippian church, this was a, a church in Philippi, which is uh, ancient Macedonia. It's now kind of Eastern Europe. It was a church that was founded by a lot of non-Jewish believers, and, and particularly women were very prominent in the foundation of that church. And as I said, Paul was writing from, from imprisonment because one of the members of the Philippian church, Epaphroditus, had visited Paul with a gift from the Philippian church. And so he's writing back to them, thanking them and just expanding on all these ideas. But what's helpful to note is that the Philippian church is actually quite a healthy church. A lot of the other churches he writes to, if you know the New Testament letters, we were looking at Colossians, for example, a few series ago. A lot of them have a lot of issues and troubles, but the Philippian church generally is a very healthy church. And so a lot of what Paul does is to encourage and unpack what it means to be a believer from that perspective. As I've said, we've covered a few of those ideas already, but today we're going to look at choosing Jesus. And the way I'm framing this is, as we go through, is I'm going to just highlight three questions that I think Paul is encouraging us to ask ourselves based on what he literally says in the text. So I'm going to highlight those, and you'll see when I read through the passage that those will be highlighted clearly. But first, let's just start by seeing how Paul sets up this little section of Philippians. So if we read that together, just starting from chapter 3, verse 1, let's read the first couple of verses just to see how Paul sets things up. He says, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. It's quite a powerful start, isn't it? And it starts with just rejoice. We've already looked at joy, but it's this idea yeah, of just rejoicing in the Lord. And I've spoken before when I, we were looking in the book of Colossians about this idea of spiritual safeguarding. If you know what safeguarding training is, it's when you work with young people or vulnerable people, you do some kind of training to safeguard yourself against it. Paul uses it against any kind of issues. Paul uses this word safeguard again. He says it is to safeguard for you, for me to repeat these things to you. And he says it, he says it in the sense of, well, these are things perhaps you already know, but I'm going to say it again because it helps you. It's going to safeguard you. If you do safeguarding training, you don't just do it once. Every year or few years, you renew your training. Even though you know it, you'll, you'll potentially just do it again and again because it's helpful for you. It's a safeguard for you. And that's what Paul is saying here. And I would encourage you this morning, if anything I say, you think, oh, I've heard that before. Oh, I've heard that before. Well, let's start with this, that it's helpful. It's a safeguard to be reminded of things, even if we already know them. And that's where Paul is saying, he's saying, these things you may know, but it's a safeguard for you. It's for your own 
safety. And what is it, what is it, what is it to keep you safe from? What is it to keep the Philippian church safe from? Well, verse 2, a sudden change of gear. Rejoice in the Lord. Oh, don't worry, I'm writing the same things. And then watch out for the dogs, the evildoers, the mutilators of the flesh. Boom. Okay, so that's, that's what we need, he's trying to keep them safe from. He switches to this very harsh language, doesn't he? And it's the kind of verse that nowadays we don't really love to read because it's quite, it's quite harsh to our ears, isn't it? It's something that we don't like. We don't really like to be warned or told we shouldn't do certain things. My son James down there, you'd have seen him around. He hates being told, no, don't do this. Don't do that. Put that down. And it, it's, it, even if the context isn't something particularly bad, I'll just say, oh, no, no, James. Yeah, it just goes crazy. But I think we're all a bit like that. When we hear someone say to us, don't do this. Watch out for that. Be careful. We don't really like that. And yet so often it's for our own safety. If I say to James, don't put that in your mouth, it's because it's probably something that's not going to be good for him to ha have in his body. If I say, don't touch that, it's probably because he's putting his hand by the oven. And Paul is saying, watch out, because there are these things that you need to be careful of. So that's, that's the context. That's the start of this passage, is that he says, whatever I say here, you may know it, but it's a safeguard for you, because there are things out there that you need to be you need to be conscious of, you need to be careful of. So let's now go into what I would say is the kind of the main, the main three points I want to make, which again, I've framed as three questions that I think Paul is asking the Philippian readers to consider. And it's three things I think we this morning should consider. So let's read on this passage together uh, from verses three. So we're going to go from verse three through to verse seven here. And you'll notice I've underlined some of the words, if you can see on the screen, um, and that is kind of the concept I'm going to focus on just so as we read through it, but um, we'll come to that. So let's read from verse 3. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for the righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And the question I want to pose to you, the question I think Paul is initially asking them to consider is, where do you put your confidence? Where do you put your confidence? So let's go back to verse 3. It says, Paul, Paul starts by saying, we are the circumcision. And that kind of makes sense of that previous verse. When it talks about mutilators of the flesh, well, I think that, that leads directly into, no, we are the circumcision. There would have been some Christians, probably Jewish Christians, who would have, would have thought to themselves, well, because as a Jew, we're supposed to circumcise ourselves, we need to keep doing that. It's part of being the people of God. You have to be circumcised. But Paul uses this strong language, mutilators of the flesh, and says, no, we are the circumcision. And if you know the Old Testament, why were the, the, the Israelites asked to circumcise? It was to set themselves apart from the other nations and to make it clear that they were God's people. But Paul says, no, we are the circumcision. We who serve God by whose spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh. That is, the people of God are not those who are circumcised, but it's people who just serve God by his spirit, who believe and trust in Jesus. And then Paul goes on to unpack this idea by using himself as an example. You know that part in a talk, which I've already used, and I'm sure I'll use again, where the preacher will use examples from their own life to sort of highlight something. That's what Paul's doing here. He uses his own life to highlight this idea. He says, if anyone had any reason to be confident in anything, look, I've got more. I was, born, I was born Jewish and was circumcised at the right time. I was part of a prominent tribe. I lived up to all of the cultural heritage that I had. I knew the law like a Pharisee. I was so zealous, I even persecuted Christians, these heathen Christians at the time. In fact, you know, if, if you compare me to the law that I learned about, you can't find anything really wrong that I did. 
Paul almost puts his achievements out there like a CV. You know, if you apply for a job, you have to list all of the things you've done. This is like Paul's CV. He says, look, look at all these things. You couldn't really blame me for any of these things I've done. And it kind of heads off, I suppose, anyone who would say, well, of course, Paul, you would say, you know, that you don't put confidence in these things because, because you're not really to this standard. No, Paul's saying, I am the top, top standard. It's like if someone came, came to me and said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm really good at football. Um, and then, you know, compared to me, they would be, no. Imagine if I pull my mask off, maybe Tom, but if, if, if you pull my mask off and I was Lionel Messi, I said, actually, hey, look, it's me. You go, well, I can't really compare, can I? Because you're, you're the top, you're the top player. Or Ronaldo, for those Man U fans who are loving life right now, maybe you, you could say him as well. But Paul was saying, I'm the top of, in, in that standard that we're setting, I would be top of that class. You can't compare. You can't compare to, to me. And yet all of that is loss compared to Christ. All of that is nothing compared to Christ. And you know what I find interesting is that Paul uses the term the flesh here. And he says, he, uses, he lists all these things under this sort of category of putting confidence in the flesh. You put confidence in all these things. And often when we think of that term, the flesh, we think of it like, Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know, we think of it as like all these bad things. That is the flesh. It's the love of money. It's, a, it's a, um, you know, vain ambition. But no, he's, he lists all of these things, which in many ways are pretty good things, as the flesh, right? He, he, I mean, yes, he persecutes Christians. We know that's not a good thing. But he followed the law. He did all the things that he thought God wanted of him. He was passionate and zealous for his faith. These aren't bad things things in and of themselves but he says that all of these things fall under this category of the flesh if they're not things that point you to Christ if they're not things that are all about Jesus because anything that's not Jesus is going to fall under that category and I think it can be very easy for us to think that way of to think of things that we that we do and think okay well that's a bad thing because it's a bad thing but so long as it's something that seems to be good then it, in and of itself that's always going to be fine but can you, if, if you think to yourself, what are the things that you, you value, you put trust in, you put confidence in, even those good things, and think to yourself, could some of those things potentially be unhelpful because you put so much confidence in them? Do you put so much confidence in your, your, in your, kind of, in your ability to do your job well? Do you put so much confidence in the good things that you do, the good deeds that you do, perhaps the, the work that you do on at church on a Sunday? All of these things can become unhelpful when we put so much confidence in them that they become distractions, that they, they pull us away from Jesus. You see, I think if we described what, the, what this, these Jewish Christians were doing, and then compare that to what we are doing, actually the description would be potentially very similar. So the way I would describe what these Jewish Christians were doing by saying you have to be circumcised to be a Christian was they're putting their trust in a meaningless act that they think will draw them closer to God, but is actually drawing their attention away from the only thing that matters, Christ. And now, insert, and now think to yourself, what are some of the things in your life that you put particular value, particular confidence in? And then think again, see if this applies to you. you. They're putting their trust in a meaningless act that they think will draw them closer to God, but is actually drawing their attention away from the only thing that matters, that is Christ. See, we can do the same thing, whether it's a good act or a not good act, whatever it is, we can put our confidence in other things. And so that's why I want us to question this idea of where do we put our confidence doesn't mean we don't do these really positive things, that we don't, we don't seek to be, do very well in our job or to serve on a Sunday. These are great things to do. But we need to be careful that that's not where our confidence lies. Where do you put your confidence? Because I think Paul is reminding the Philippian church here, choose to put your confidence in Christ because nothing else is worth it. That's the first question I want you to consider this morning. Where do you put your confidence. But let's carry on reading now in verses 8 to 9. Paul goes on to say, what is more, so carrying on from this, what is more, after all this list of things, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. 
I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And again, I want to use a word that's repeated a couple of times there, which is righteousness. Whose righteousness do you trust? So Paul goes on, of course, to hammer home this point that nothing compares to Christ. All of his attempts at holiness are rubbish compared to what he gains in Christ. But then your question might naturally be, well, what do I gain then? If I'm saying all of these things are rubbish, all of these things are nothing, what do I gain in its place? Well, he says it's Christ's righteousness that should be in its place. Paul is making it clear that what we need more than anything is something external to ourselves. And that's, th that's one of the hardest things to hear because as human beings, we just naturally want to have control of our lives, don't we? We want to feel like what I do matters. What, what, what I do is going to have an impact on where, on where things head. And Paul is saying here, none of this stuff, whether good or bad or whatever it is in between, none of this stuff will impact your righteousness. Only Christ can give us that. Only something external to ourselves can give us what we need. To have a right relationship with God, we need Christ to give that to us. I remember when, um, when James was very young, he was in hospital because he was about seven weeks early. And so five weeks he was in hospital and we had to um, go in and, you know, it was a very stressful time and he had all these operations and such. And I remember at that time just feeling completely like nothing was in my control. I couldn't do anything in that situation. And it was, it was horrible. It, was, it, was just, it went against everything we, we feel as people. But it also taught me that letting go and letting God have control and just saying, God, this is in your hands is also a very freeing experience. But it is hard. It's, comp it's really hard to be in that position. But Paul is saying that's where we should be all the time. We should always be saying, God, it's only on you. It's nothing I do. It's only on you. And this, this, and this righteousness that he talks about that comes from God, he says it's just based on faith. It's just based on trusting it. It's an active choice that we have to make to choose to trust in God's righteousness, in Christ's righteousness, and not our own. Because our natural state is to have faith plus other things, isn't it? Our natural state is, oh, I trust in God, but then also it is, there's still things I can do to make things right. That's why a lot of people have issues with the Catholic Church, is because a lot of, a lot of the things they believe are, seem like additions, like extra things that they've added on. You need to do it to pray to Mary. You need to go to Mass. You need to do these extra rituals and various things. And it's, it often feels like it's like faith plus X. You need this plus more. And yet we, we look at that and we go, yeah, well, that's not me. But actually, we all often do that, either consciously or subconsciously. We think about things and we think, if only I could just do more of this, then maybe I'd, I'd be more close to, to being accepted by God. Maybe if I just did this, I, I need my faith, of course, but that's to, be, that's to be this and this, and maybe just a bit of this to make it work. It's very easy to add things to that. But Paul is saying, think of all those things, all those things you put value in, all of those, those things you put confidence in, they're nothing compared to Christ because it's his righteousness is the only thing that we need, the only thing that can step in where we can't. So it's whose righteousness do you trust? Is it, is it Christ's alone or is it a bit of your own? Is it a bit of this and a bit of that and then Christ? Because think of it this way. If we, want, if we want to give Christ 100%, if we want to give him 100% credit, everything that we try and do is taking away that credit from what Christ did. If we say, okay, well, 11% is me, then 89% is Christ. No, Paul's saying it's 100% Jesus, 100% Christ. Whose righteousness do you trust? Because Paul is saying trust in Christ's righteousness because what our own is never going to be enough. And then let's move on to verses 10 and 11 where Paul says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. So the third question I want to ask you this morning is, do you want to know Christ? Do you? Do you want to know Christ? 
And you might think, well, that doesn't apply to me. I mean, I'm, I'm already a Christian. You know, maybe if someone here is, is, is a brand new person and you haven't been to church before, you're, you're exploring what it means to be a Christian, then, you know, it might seem like this is just for you. I'm saying this to everybody here, to myself included. Do I want to know Christ? Do I want to know Christ? Because Paul says that is worth more than anything. Let's go back to verse 8 again. He, he highlights this back there as well. He says, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. It is of surpassing worth to know Jesus. It's worth more than all of those things. In fact, he says, Compared to, the, compared to Jesus, these things all seem like complete rubbish. But not only that, but Paul says that I've lost, I've, that I've lost things because of this. And that's, that's fine. For whose sake I've lost all things, he says. To participate in his sufferings, Paul says. Remember he was writing from a prison cell. He would have been pretty high in society before when he was probably persecuting Christians. He already laid out his CV, so he probably would have been a well-respected figure. But he's probably lost a lot because of this. And I want to challenge anyone here, whether or not you, you've engaged with this kind of thing or not, but there, there, were, there were sort of people out there, there were preachers out there who talk what you might call a prosperity gospel. That is this idea that if you become a Christian, if you believe in Jesus, then you should expect health and wealth. You should expect everything to go great for you. And I would just challenge you and those people to read this passage and try and figure out, well, how does this make sense of that? Because ultimately, Paul is saying that actually anything I do is worth more than anything else in this world. And so when I lose things, that's completely fine. In fact, that's great. I can participate in Christ's suffering. Jesus himself says in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. But in this world, you will have trouble. You will have trouble, Jesus says. He says, he literally says to expect trouble. He says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Great. But sandwiched between these two great things, you have peace, I've overcome the world. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. So is knowing Jesus valuable enough to you that you're willing to accept trouble? Is knowing Jesus valuable enough to you that you're willing to accept that things may not go our way all the time? You don't expect always health and wealth. Paul is saying it's worth it. Paul is saying it's worth knowing Christ. It's of surpassing worth. But do you want to know Christ? Not because of the material things we get out of it, but because we want to be in right relationship with him. We become found in him, Paul says. The weight of sin is lifted from our shoulders. We know that a future resurrection is coming, Paul says again in verse 11. So there, of course there are these things that, that, we, that we kind of gain from it, but it's nothing in this world that we gain. And don't get me wrong, becoming a Christian can have a profound impact on lots of people's lives. If, if people have a struggle with addiction or, or various other things, when you become a Christian, of course, you often see a transformation. So it's not to say that you won't see a positive impact on becoming a Christian. But it's to say that we shouldn't expect these things because ultimately what we're, what we're gaining is nothing of this world. It's Christ alone that we're gaining and all that comes with that. It's scary, isn't it? It's a scary idea to know Christ that much, to be willing to lose that much. Tim Keller, uh, who's a famous preacher, he preached a sermon on grace and after that sermon, he was approached by a woman who was, I think, a new believer, who said that she found the concept of grace scary. Scary. You know, we think, I think as Christians, we often think, oh, grace is the, the wonderful thing. You know, it's, it's, it's the, the, the cool thing we can share with people. But she said it was scary. And Tim Keller asked her uh, why she found this idea scary. And this is what Tim Keller recalls her answer, which I think is extremely profound. So re Tim Keller recalls that she said something like this. If I was saved by my good works then there'll be a limit to what God could ask of me or put me through. I'd be like a taxpayer with rights. I would have done my duty, and now I would deserve a certain quality of life. But if it is really true that I am a sinner, saved by sheer grace at God's infinite cost, then there's nothing he cannot ask of me. That's the profound truth of grace, is that it's a wonderful free gift of God, but it also means that nothing you can do will add to or take away from what Christ did. And therefore, God can ask 
anything of you. It's not like, oh, I've done my bit. I've done my part. I've prayed enough today. I've done enough of this. So God can't ask any more of me. No. What God did for you is of infinite worth, of surpassing worth, as Paul put it. And so actually, that's why Paul can be in prison and say, and he can rejoice, as we've looked at before. That's why he can be in prison and he can say, all of these things that, I've, that I had and all of these things that I've lost, none of it matters compared to Christ. None of it matters compared to knowing Christ. That is such a challenge, isn't it? Do you want to know Christ like that? I know I don't. <laughs> I know I don't know. I don't, I don't want to know Christ enough. I want, to, I want to grow in that. I want to grow in that. And the, the great thing about this passage is that, it, is that as we kind of come to the conclusion here, we're going to read verse 12, and that really helps us. Because after hearing all this, you probably are thinking, oh my gosh, how can I do all this? How, how can I do this? Because this just seems impossible. This just seems impossible. To, what, to, to want to know Christ, to put my confidence in Christ and his righteousness as, as much as this, it just seems, this seems incredibly high bar to set. Well, first of all, before we get to that, I just want to say, remember we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our helper. That is, that is literally how it's described by Jesus when he says, I will send the Holy Spirit. He's our helper. And it's just, just for these sort of situations. So if you think you can't do it in your own strength, you're right. You cannot. I cannot. None of us can. But the Holy Spirit can help us in this way. So trust in the Holy Spirit. Ask for the Holy Spirit's help. But let's also just read verse 12, which comes after all of this kind of deep theological stuff. Paul says, not that I've already obtained all this. <laughs> so after all of that, he said, well, not that I've got it sorted or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. So Paul says, I mean, I haven't got this nailed down. I haven't reached this, this, this point that I'm aiming for yet, which is phew. I'm glad, I'm glad he said that because it, because it feels a bit overwhelming, doesn't it? But what he does say is, I still press on. I press on to the goal. I press on to what Christ has called me to. So when he says that, I'm pressing on, it's like a continual thing, isn't it? If someone said, I'm pressing on, you wouldn't think they just did that as a one-time thing. Oh, I'm pressing on, and then I lay back, and it's just... No, pressing on is something you continually do, day by day. And that's what Paul is saying. I press on every day. I choose these things. Every day I choose to put confidence in Christ. Every day I choose to trust in his righteousness over my own. And every day I choose to make knowing Christ the number one thing that I want from my day. See, I think choosing Jesus, we're going back to that at the start, choosing Jesus is something we have to choose to do every single day. It's not just something you do once when you put your faith in Jesus. It's not something you just choose to do when you get baptized or whatever, you, whatever kind of other thing you might think of as like a significant moment in your life. You choose Jesus every day. You press on towards this goal. And we, I know we don't, meet, we don't meet it every day. Some days we're fired up for the gospel. Some days we feel like, yes, my confidence is there. I'm, I've, I've, Christ is at the forefront of my mind. I want to know him today. I want to see him uh, in my workplace. I want to see him in my day. But many times we don't reach that standard. But we can still press on towards that. We can still press on towards choosing him. There was, there's a new day. The wonderful thing I think about God creating days is that we go to sleep and we wake up and it's a new day, isn't it? That new day, we can make a new choice. I'm going to choose Jesus today. I'm going to choose to put my confidence in him and his righteousness and put knowing him as my number one priority. So choose Jesus every day. So let's just conclude. Let's wrap up. And I think it would be great for us all to just spend a little time just reflecting on some of those questions as well as that encouragement at the end. So where do you put your confidence? Where does it go? Whose righteousness do you trust? Do you trust in your own? Do you trust in Jesus? And do you want to know Christ? Do you really want to know Christ? But we, we can know that we can press on and choose Jesus every day. So let's press on, church. Let's press on into everything Christ has 
for us. I'm just going to pray. Um, while I pray, maybe um, Jonathan, Phoebe, Tom, you can come up at the front um, so we can worship together. And I would encourage you during the worship as we sing, if you, don't, if you, if you want to just continue reflecting, don't feel like you have to, to verbalize. You can just sit there and just reflect on it. Or as we sing these words, um, then, then use those words as a real prayer for your life. But let's just pray together to conclude. Father, thank you that you are wonderful, you are glorious, you are good. Lord, as we read this letter from Paul to the Philippian church, and as we think about the kind of questions it's asking them and it's asking us, Lord, I pray that your spirit would work in us this morning to soften our hearts, to open our ears to hear from you, and to just allow us to to put things in the right perspective, put them in this perspective you want us to have, Lord, so that we can choose you day by day. Lord, we want you to be number one in our life. We know that you are of surpassing worth. And this is something, Lord, Paul says that this is something we probably know. We probably came in today knowing this information. We're leaving. We probably still know it. But Lord, this is a safeguard for our church, Lord, to be reminded to choose Jesus again today. Lord, we want to choose you today. We want to choose you tomorrow, Lord. But we need your help. We need your Holy Spirit to help us, Lord, as we press on towards that goal, Lord. So I pray, Father, that we would reflect on these things and that you would work in us this morning as we reflect on what it means to choose you above all things. So, Father, be with us today and the next day and the next as we think about and reflect on these things, Lord, in this time. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.